Hi everyone, I have been warned never to address inspiring philosophy or Johannan rocks. So let's do that. Well, I must say that I feel flattered that I finally got Martimer to respond. He's not a dumb guy, and he knows a thing or two about physics. And given that I'm going to be giving a talk on this later this month, I actually appreciate someone with physics credentials giving me some fencing practice beforehand. So thank you, Martimer. Let's do this, shall we? arrangements of it is the extreme view of realism. Realism is a general belief. To start out, it may surprise you to learn that I actually identify as a naturalist, though I'm not sure how IP feels about that label. That is, that I think that all of reality is governed by the laws of physics. However, given Hempel's dilemma and some of the discoveries in physics, I just don't think that our use of the word physical has meaningful significance anymore. See, the natural-supernatural dichotomy is a hallmark of substance dualism, but we are idealists. Uh, we believe the physical is emergent from the non-physical, but I view both as natural in that both are lawlike. Let's be clear on this. You define realism as physical reality exists, independent of observation. Okay, that's not what realism means in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, what I will refer to as quantum realism, for the sake of clarity, means that the state of a quantum system is determined. It is distinct. It exists independent of observation. The system exists in a particular state, even when it's not being observed. I thought you were going to make this point, so let's look at this. Yes, quantum non-realism means that there are no hidden variables determining the properties of a system prior to measurement, but let's look closer at what realism, or more precisely counterfactual definiteness, is in quantum mechanics. Counterfactual definiteness, or CFD, is the ability to speak meaningfully about the definiteness of the results of measurements even if they were not performed. Now let's compare that with realism as it is used in philosophy. Contemporary philosophical realism is the belief that our reality, or some aspect of it, is ontologically independent of our perceptions. Now as you can see, these two are effectively the same thing. There is no effective distinction between the ability to speak meaningfully about a result prior to measurement and the belief that these results exist prior to perception or measurement. One can assert a distinction, maybe, but that would be neither falsifiable nor parsimonious. And so at this point, we should take Zeilinger's advice on the matter. We have learned in the history of physics that it is important not to make distinctions that have no basis, such as the pre Newtonian distinction between the laws on Earth and those that govern the motions of heavenly bodies. I would suggest that in a similar way, the distinction between reality and our knowledge of reality, between reality and information, cannot be made. There is no way to refer to reality without using the information we have about it. So if we are going to dispose of Ptolemaic epicycles in astronomy, we should also dispose of philosophical realism in quantum mechanics. If you're referring to structural realism, however, I do think of that as compatible with idealism. Didn't you pay attention to Dr. Quantum from the clip from What the Bleep Do We Know that you just subjected me to? Yes, What the Bleep had a lot of pseudoscience, but the Dr. Quantum clips were good, and they make for good cinematic quality YouTube videos too, so I really don't see why people keep harping on them. Dr. Quantum explicitly explained that a particle will act as a wave if it's not observed, but as a particle if it is observed. Mathematically speaking, yes, wave functions behave as though there is a wave that produces the observables upon measurement. Depending on one's interpretation, though, there need not necessarily be an actual wave there in physical space-time. I myself happen to be operating from the digital physics paradigm. In fact, in some of our quantum gravity models, the wave function does not really exist in physical space beyond our mathematical modeling of it. Rather, that's why the Wheeler-DeWitt equation produces wave functionals rather than wave functions, where the role of variable and function is reversed. So, in that case, the wave function would come prior to space-time, rather than the other way around. The idea with that is that the wave function is actually non-local, and is what generates physical space. Observation, which simply means interaction with another system, affects the state of a quantum system, such as an electron. It doesn't bring the system into existence. If it didn't exist to begin with, it couldn't possibly have been observed. Well, it existed in that it was data on God's proverbial hard drive, or in God's memories before we looked at it, but it wasn't rendered into physical reality before we looked. That's what we mean when we say that it didn't exist before we looked. It's there behind physical reality in the hard drive, but it's not physically there, rendered into the computer game quite yet. 
according to the Schrodinger equation, which I doubt you understand. I do, actually. I'm sitting with my good old Griffiths text right here, and I remember studying the Schrodinger equation for most of a semester. The Schrodinger equation doesn't say that a particle is a wave function or exists as a wave function. It simply uses the wave function to describe how the state of a quantum system changes over time. Okay, look. I'm still working with IP, but come on, you're kind of getting lost in semantics here. The Schrodinger equation is one of the first things you learn about when you take an introductory course in quantum mechanics as an undergraduate. Basically, if you don't know what this means, please do everyone a favor. Don't ever talk about quantum mechanics. Ever. Well, this is going to be a problem for you then, because your advice does not apply to me. See, unlike many with a physics degree, I'm a bit of a rogue. I will wire up all sorts of people to cause all kinds of mischief with this stuff. Speaking of which, I have a somewhat maniacal idea. I know Martimer often critiques spirit science, and so if anyone from the Spirit Science channel happens to be watching this, please tell Jordan Dutchneys I have an offer he can't refuse. Take two dice, one black and one white, and let them represent two entangled particles. I shake them up, and without looking, I separate them, one in either hand. Now, if I look in my right hand and I find the white one there, I know instantly that the black one is in my left hand. The two gloves analogy? Seriously? I, I'm kind of surprised you fell for that. That's what Einstein believed and was proven wrong. It simply is not the case that one was white and one was black all along. The dice are neither black nor white before measurement, but a sum of the two states. That is, after all, why it is called quantum superposition. No, Bell's inequality being violated means that quantum mechanics violates local realism. What I will refer to as quantum realism, for the sake of clarity, means that the state of a quantum system is determined. It is distinct. It exists independent of observation. The system exists in a particular state, even when it's not being observed. Yes, and what is local realism? IP pointed out that it is the existence of local hidden variables. And I believe you had just pointed out earlier in your own video that quantum realism refers to the existence of hidden variables. So if you're going to attempt a debunking video, it may be helpful if you not contradict yourself in your own video. In other words, you can have a theory that doesn't violate relativity, or you can have hidden variables, but you can't have both. Yes. Thank you for admitting that quantum realism violates relativity. How the hell did you get to that? All we've established is that you can't have both locality and realism. Are you saying that Bell's theorem says that we can't have either? How did he get to it? Well, how did you just get to it? You just admitted yourself that either the particles have defined properties before measurement or relativity is violated. Wait, you're not saying. Martimer. Tachyon particles only exist on Star Trek. You do understand that, right? The act of a conscious observer creates the existence of the physical objects and the properties they entail. Conscious. Okay, you know what I said about you not pulling things completely out of your ass? Well, I wouldn't have worded it like that. We did discuss this afterwards, but in terms of the exact distinctions, I didn't feel that was too significant. Von Neumann has the same implications anyway, and digital physics has similar implications once you realize that consciousness is merely integrated information. I was hoping to clarify this point in IP's video, however, and I actually have in some of my older videos, and so now I have my opportunity. Our minds aren't the only things that collapse a wave function. Everything that can interact collapses a wave function. And, well, minds fall under the category of everything. And so if we want to go further into the philosophical implications of that, we can say that this is the one point in all of science that bridges what we would impute to be objective reality with subjective perception. Anyway, if you watch my older videos on this, I will refer you to Wigner's Friend's Quantum Mind and The Action of Mind on Brain, which is a lecture by Henry Stapp on von Neumann chains. But again, realism doesn't refer to metaphysical realism. It refers to quantum realism that a quantum system exists in a distinct state independent of observation. Okay, firstly, as I pointed out before, there is no meaningful distinction between counterfactual definiteness and philosophical realism, at least insofar as experiments are concerned. Secondly, talk to the Heisch. So recent experiments led by a group at the University of Vienna, Austria, provide the most compelling evidence yet 
that there is no objective reality beyond what we observe. So it's really the observation, the observation that creates the reality. And what they found is that Leggett's inequality is violated as well as Bell's. Even if you allow for instantaneous influences, quantum measurements do not fit with the idea of an objective reality. Thirdly, as for locality, I'm sorry, but you made me do it. I'm afraid I'm going to have to deploy the Markopoulos. Right? So, in quantum gravity, now, probably what's going on is what we're seeing is that the whole notion of space and time is probably not really fundamental. So, space... That, that sounds incredible that space and time is not fundamental. Space and yeah. time seem, in an ordinary sense, to be the most fundamental thing. And everything else seems to happen in space and time as sort of the fixed background. Right, which is what makes this problem so exciting and so strange. That I, I don't know of any description of anything that we have that is not in space time. But you're you're trying to do away with space altogether? With space, yes. Uh, but that is a bit easier to do away with. The existence of the system, or the rest of the universe for that matter, is not in question. Of course. It's a program in the hard drive before you load it up into the computer game. I never said otherwise. This is not in dispute, but if you think this means that a planet is no different than an electron, then think again. The equations of quantum mechanics are reduced to those of classical physics at macroscopic scales. We never said they don't. As you go up in size, the probability spread gets smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually converges on a classical limit. That's why you don't see cars quantum tunneling through garage doors, but that doesn't mean the system is still not in superposition and thus non-real. But they're completely negligible in an object consisting of trillions upon trillions of them. That's the difference. Negligible does not mean non-existent. For example, if I were to use the matrix as an analogy, we would have to zoom in very far to actually see the bizarre information processing effects in the matrix. The day-to-day -day scale in the matrix would seem quite classical, however. But nevertheless, none of it would actually be real. So no, a planet will not quantum tunnel through a star when you are not looking, but it will not be there when you are not looking either. Or as Nobel laureate David Merman pointed out, the moon is demonstrably not there when no one is looking. And now, I know this is not technically his field, but Robert Lanza makes a pretty good point regarding systems that involve trillions upon trillions of particles. Robert thinks we must apply the rules of the microscopic world to our everyday experiences, since everything we see, hear, and touch is made up of microscopic particles, which led him to wonder what really happens when a tree falls in the woods. So when a tree falls in the forest, it creates an ear pressure disturbance. According to simple science, that occurs whether or not anyone is there to observe it. But we know for a fact that without the observer, that not a single particle in the tree or the air itself exists with definite properties. So unless someone is actually observing the tree falling, there are no particles there to make the noise. A golf ball is never going to tunnel through a wall or interfere with itself as it goes through a double slit. Simply put, this is because all the randomness of the quantum world cancels out at large scales. Exactly, and none of us ever said it would. The quantum probabilities of the particles largely average out of the classical scale. It will still interfere with itself, however, but the interference will be astronomically negligible so as to go unnoticed. Entities here refers to assumptions. If I assume the existence of an infinite number of worlds, I am making one assumption. I actually agree with you rather than IP at this point, that said, MWI cannot derive the Born rule and gives you 50-50 probabilities for everything. However, interestingly, our best shot at deriving the Born rule, the amplitudehedron, only works because it models particle interactions as not occurring in space-time. In fact, there's currently no interpretation of quantum mechanics that makes fewer assumptions than many worlds. At that point, I'd have to disagree. It unnecessarily assumes realism, and then also assumes a multiverse to make sense of said realism. Furthermore, if we move outside of quantum mechanics proper into quantum gravity research, the digital physics approach makes far more sense in terms of explaining the merger of QM and GR. Some examples of this are actually very intuitive if you compare them to information processing effects in video games. I'll leave some links in the description if you are curious as to what I mean. Now, your interpretation assumes that wave functions exist as real objects, 
What? Like this? Despite there being no such thing as a real object. Again, it's real, but in a different sense. In the same way that data in the hard drive is real, but not real inside of the quote-unquote physical world that the computer game is generated. And that consciousness is fundamental to reality. I'll skip 3 and 4 due to precise details regarding my own view, though I will say that Copenhagen is still good as an approximation in relaying the metaphysical implications of QM. But now 5 is trivially provable if you think about philosophy of mind for just a moment. Or for that matter, basic epistemology. Any properly grounded epistemology will start with Cartesian skepticism. That is, that the mind would still exist even if the whole objectively real material world were an illusion. And by the way, that includes brains, neuroscientific experiments, neural processes, and neurons, just in case anyone wants to attempt to inject scientism at this point. But if the mind could exist in such a world even though matter can't, that would mean that nothing non-mental would exist in such a world. Therefore, it's trivially obvious that mentality is fundamental. And if you remove dualism on grounds of incoherence, then you end up with an argument for idealism based on nothing more than proper epistemology before even justifying empirical induction. So yes, the fundamentality of the mental is just a given, and you need to give up on rudimentary epistemology to disagree. A wizard did it. Literally. Hey, I'm not appealing to wizards here. Remember, I'm a naturalist. If God exists, he can be explained with physics. God of the gaps only applies to dualistic concepts of theism. But how could this wizard exist, absent a pre-existing reality created by another conscious being within which he could exist? Well, this wizard simply is pre-existing reality, but that should be obvious on grounds of modal idealism when combined with the incoherence of dualism. And while we've crossed over into philosophy for a moment, I'll take care of your infinite regress problem too. Why does this wizard exist? Well, it can be argued that an idealist reality is identical with a mathematical or platonic reality, and platonic reality is innately existent. I have a little philosophy video on this that gets into Green talking about Tegmark's mathematical universe hypothesis in the description below if you're curious. It's magic, bitch. I don't have to explain it. Again, I didn't say anything about magic. At least not any magic that can't be scientifically explained. That's for dualism, not idealism. In fact, we don't even know of any mind that can exist without a physical brain that is the product of billions of years of evolution. No, you have it all backwards. We don't know of any objectively real space-time containing an objectively real brain that can be rendered into physical existence without a mind. And to say that the brain and space-time are real is to question beg against the very thing you were supposed to be disproving. We are saying the brain is not objectively real, so you cannot defer to objectively real brains to say that brains are objectively real. What you've presented here is a false dichotomy. Classical materialism or idealism. Either reality is made up of interactions of objects that at their most fundamental level are made up of little balls that are simply smaller versions of macroscopic ones, or reality is just a mental construct. Those are not the only two options. Technically this could be correct, and I wouldn't have presented it like this, but on examination of everything, including digital physics, it doesn't seem plausible for it to be any other way. We believe that everything within the natural world can be reduced to matter, its properties, and its interactions, because it certainly looks that way. Well, it's interesting that you define the physical world as matter and energy existing in space and time, because according to quantum gravity researchers, the space-time rug has been pulled out on matter and energy altogether. The future, at least, of this development will be that we start actually with information. So information is going to be our starting point, uh, and space-time is not something that we start with. Uh, we, we, we forget about what space is and what time, uh, and then somehow the information, by thinking about how much information is, what information is doing, then the space-time will, what we call, be emergent. It will come out of just a bunch of zeros and ones. Get it for a quantum, a quantum theory of gravity is that space-time is not fundamental. Um, that space-time is, if you like, an effective emergent description from something else that underlies it. Um, so, and that something else could be information in the following way. That just space doesn't exist. Uh, describe world without space using model. We have a word for things that don't reduce to matter, its properties, and its interactions. Magic. When you can show me magic and demonstrate that it really is magic, then I'll give up materialism. Say so, yeah. No, it's information, you know, digital physics. Wheeler's it from bit. That said, now that you bring up magic, my trollish side has tempted me to do something. 
If the world is made of information, then at least hypothetically speaking, one could use cheat codes on it. And I suppose that would look kind of like magic. And now to double troll you, I will quote Michio Kaku on magic. Have fun! I'm a theoretical physicist, and I like to say that I walk in the footsteps of giants like Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr. I'm not a philosopher. However, I am rather dazzled by the fact that many of the basic mysteries that we find in string theory and the theory of everything seem to be mirrored, mirrored in the Zohar and in the Kabbalah. So there you have it, magic, straight from the mouth of one of the world's leading superstring theorists. Of course, completely explicable in scientific terms. So are you now going to give up materialism? And now to troll everyone even more. Thoughts are not a vibration. Where do you even get this idea? And even if it were a vibration, a vibration of what? So given the hard problem of consciousness, mind has to be immaterial, and given the interaction problem, dualism has to be impossible, and so therefore, logically, monistic idealism has to be true, and we have to be inside of Bishop Berkeley's God's dream. But now, thoughts or information in a dream universe is non-local i.e. it's not located in the virtual space that the dream is generating. So now, where do we find non-local information processing within the laws of physics of our universe? And how does our physics describe it? If Jordan's fans are still watching this, this is for you. It seems I've found your vibrations. Along came quantum mechanics, which says that these dots of matter, the electron, the proton, are not really dots at all. In some sense, they're waves, waves of vibration. Things are waving, and this means that our bodies are actually waving as well. This is the basis of wave mechanics, the fact that particles have wave-like properties. Then the embarrassing question is, what is waving? What is it that is waving? The answer is, and you're not going to like this, the answer is that what is waving is the probability of finding that particle at a given point. So wait, is, is sorcery science or magic? Yes and yes. For now, all you need is a basic combat spell, making fire. What causes molecules to heat up? They vibrate? Everything we see is in a constant state of vibration, thus the illusion of solidity. But how do we take that which appears solid and have it burst into flames? We will the vibrations to go faster. Step one, clear your mind. Step two, see the molecules. Step three, make them shake. Now you can find us on Facebook at Idealism and Science vs. Atheism. This mind is the matrix of all matter.